Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to your fave film critic. This is the podcast starring, produced, hosted, uh, curated, organized by your favorite film critic, me, Dom Griffin. And this is episode 21 of the podcast. If every episode took a year to make, the podcast could get legally fucked up uh, today, tonight. So yeah, um... This is going to be an episode that I don't have a ton to talk about this week. Uh, my friend Kyle, who asked us a question on, on the Q&A section of this episode today, had texted me the other day and he was like, Hey, you haven't logged anything on Letterboxd like all week. Are you okay? And uh, I just, I, 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 for one thing, I love Kyle and he's an amazing friend, but also like, it's very funny that like that is sort of. Like, hey, man, you haven't, like, posted, you haven't, like, watched any movies and told us about it in days. And I realized that, like, I don't know, like, if I lived alone or something and, like, I, like, a bookshelf fell on me and I died or something, that, like, that would be the first telltale sign. Other than, like, my job, like, my job would, like, the next day know I'm, like, something happened to me. But I feel like otherwise people would just be like, yeah, man, this letterbox has been bare, you know. I haven't seen Dom post any weird memes lately or something you know it's like oh, i'm worried uh i'm okay no i'm okay i just uh it's been a not a great week to be entirely honest uh thanksgiving was crazy work was nuts this weekend was pretty nuts and i just have not i, I watched a movie that i'll touch on somewhat later uh but this week most of what i watched was actually just wrestling and i know this is a movie podcast but I don't want to like make up my thoughts about movies. You know what I mean? I don't want to be like, well, I didn't watch anything this week, but you know, so like I do believe I'll probably just be honest and just, there's going to be a huge chunk of this show that's just going to be about, about pro wrestling. So I know I've done this a few times before. If you were not a fan of that, I apologize. Feel free to skip this week. I have other stuff I'll probably watch this week. It'll probably be more, more movie, you know, like, you know, the, the real stuff later we could just i don't know this is sort of like a like a fill-in issue do you know what i mean like if you read comics and um like the artist is like behind on deadline or something and you're reading like a six-part storyline it episode like part four will come out and the next month it'll be like a completely unrelated story with a different writer and a different artist that's just like hey you ever wonder what Azrael is doing in gotham while we wait to find out what's happening to batman you know this is gonna be that we're gonna we're going to check in with Jean-Paul, uh, Jean-Paul Valley. I almost, I almost said Jean-Paul Levesque, uh, who is not as real and, and Batman, um, which if that helps you understand exactly how wrestling my brain has been this week. Uh, I feel like, like I talk, I talked about this, about this on the channel and the, the pod previously. I, I like a lot of different stuff. Movies is like the main thing, but like, I, I love comics. I love pro wrestling. I love music and stuff. And I feel like I tend to cycle through those interests. There's parts of the year where like, I just don't watch wrestling at all. I just don't feel like it. I'm like burnt out or whatever. Um, but I've noticed that like weeks where I don't want to watch shows or I don't feel like watching a movie, I'll just think I don't have time. I don't have time to watch a movie this week. I'll uh, discover that I have watched like 11 hours of pro wrestling you know what i mean that week <laughs> so um it's not like i didn't have the time it's more just like i didn't have the wherewithal i don't know i sometimes i know i make watching movies sound like a chore or like engaging with movies i make it sound like it's like hard and i feel like that might i don't know if it's annoying to people but it definitely kind of makes me seem kind of like melodramatic i guess where it's like you couldn't muster up the courage to watch a movie this week, pal. Like, like I tried. That's actually, not, that's, that's true. I did uh, two days ago. Uh, I had some plans fall through and I was like, shit, I should watch a few movies. You know, I haven't watched very many noirs. I usually watch a lot of film noir in November. So I tried to think of a couple of movies I could watch mainly for pod fodder. To be entirely honest, I was like, if I watch a couple of movies, I'll, I could talk about it on the pod tomorrow. Um, I was thinking about making like a noir November themed episode or something. Uh, and I got as far as wanting to watch Miller's Crossing, uh, the Coen Brothers movie, which is like one of my favorite movies of all time. 
and then trying to figure out what would make a good double or triple feature with Miller's Crossing. And then that led me to just reading like several letterbox lists made by uh, users uh, of movies based on Dashiell Hammett uh, fiction. Uh, and and then I realized there was not other, it, there wasn't, there weren't any good lists necessarily of other movies that are heavily influenced by and based on Dashiell Hammett's writing, but not actually adaptations of his work. So Miller's Crossing uh, is like such a beautiful love letter to like the way, the specific way that Dash writes. And it has elements that like feel kind of like Red Harvest, I guess, you know. And there's like several movies that are essentially just Red Harvest. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's a it's a story that's been adapted in a lot of different ways. Uh, but I don't want to watch any of those. I was like, there's got to be another movie where someone like the Coens made a similar type of movie. And there's not, to my knowledge, like if you're listening to this and you know the perfect back end of a Miller's Crossing double feature, I'll just do it this week because I still want to watch the movie. Uh, I haven't watched it in a minute, but yeah, I just, I got lost in doing that. And then before I knew it, like, uh, AW Dynamite came on and I didn't even like really want to watch it to be entirely honest. Uh, but I've gotten into the habit of when I am home on Wednesday nights, I like to watch it, uh, primarily with, um, like a discord server that I'm on. And like, I watch it with a bunch of other guys who are also not necessarily really big fans of the show and it's, it just makes it more entertaining, I guess. So I did that and I was, I mean, I like spending time with those guys. They're, they're all amazing. I love them so much. Uh, but I do sort of wish I did not watch two hours of all elite wrestling programming when I could have been watching Miller's Crossing, which is a beautiful, fantastic movie. So I kind of fucked up that one. Um, but I did watch some other, some other stuff in wrestling happened that I kind of want to talk about. So I'll just talk about it later. And the one movie I saw, which spoiler alert is about wrestling too. So there's that, <laughs> uh, we've got some good questions at the end. I think that'll be fun. And, uh, I'll just lead off with like one brief news item and then I'll, I'll get into what I watched and, and why and all that stuff. So yeah, uh, news time. Uh, I went through like news articles that I've read or like bookmarked or like for read, read later and stuff. And like, I couldn't find anything that was like a real news item that I had any thoughts on. It was a lot of like trickling information from stories that I talked about last week. Uh, the only thing like I was actually just like, I guess I have to skip the news this week cause I have, I got nothing. I have nothing. Uh, and then, uh, I got home from, I had a, like a extra long day at work today. The second I got home, I saw that Warner brothers released the trailer for Furiosa, the new George Miller movie, the prequel to Mad Max Fury Road. And I thought it looked pretty good. I thought the trailer looked good. Uh, it's kind of fun seeing Chris Hemsworth in like a weird part. He doesn't he doesn't do like weird as, as often as you think he he could because he has the potential for it. So I'm curious to see how that goes. Anya Taylor Joy getting to play young Furios is pretty cool. I guess she's good and stuff. Uh, I'm not I'm not sold entirely on the fact that it does at least on first glance look and feel a lot just like Fury Road. And I thought it would be like you know, like that, but like different and the, fi the finished product what probably will be, but the trailer alone, I was like, this just feels a lot like Fury Road. And I liked Fury Road quite a bit, you know, but I, I don't know that I wanted to see, it'll probably be good. I, I did see a tweet where someone was saying how like, you know, Fury Road at the time felt like, like the biggest and like best movie of all time for like a moment. Do you know what I mean? Like it was just so immediately like, yo, this rules that even if the, if this prequel is like, pretty damn good people are maybe gonna hate it because it won't be able to to to, to live up to fury road i i saw him make a direct comparison of of matrix and the matrix sequels and then i thought about it and i was like you know what if furiosa is like the matrix reloaded of mad max movies that's actually pretty cool uh people will probably bitch about it but i think uh, i think that could be good so i'm excited about that i think it comes out in may of 2024 so like we're like six months away and it's around, you know, what March we've got Dune 2. And then sometime at the end of spring, I think we get Mickey 17, the new Bong Joon-ho movie with Robert Pattinson. An embarrassment of riches. You know, it's a, it's nice to remind yourself that like you get these really good passages of time where it's like, boom, boom, boom. A bunch of filmmakers you like put out new work and it's really cool. So I'm excited for Furiosa. I hope it's good. That's really, it just boils down to I hope it's good. That's all you can really ask for in this world anymore. 
Uh, but yeah, I, that's, that's the news. I don't, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's really all I have to say about that. Uh, so what I watched this week, um, I, for Black Friday, I was at work almost the entire day. It was nuts. It was the, like the craziest day we've had at the theater since like the Barbenheimer days. I say that like, that's a war I fought in, but it was like, what, three months ago, <laughs> four months ago. Um, but it was, it was crazy. It was really busy. A lot of our, the, like half of our management team was on, on holiday. Um, but we, we got through it. It was, uh, it was beastly. Napoleon was doing very well, uh, with all the dads out there in town for the holidays. Uh, Hunger Games was kind of holding strong with like the younger folk. It was a pretty good weekend, but like, I just ended up being really like, uh, burnt out from the past week. It was like several days in a row of like heavy, heavy work. So that by the end of it, when I was, uh, I was off Monday, I had to do work from home. So it wasn't really a day off. That was a day where I was like, I should squeeze in some movies. And I just, I did not, um, at all. <laughs> and most of that is just because I, um, like I said, it was like this, this pro wrestling state. Uh, big thing is that uh, for some months, uh, I, I believe a few episodes ago, several episodes ago now, I had an extended period where I, I guess I'll probably just link to it in like a card or something. Uh, but there's an episode of the show where I talked about All Elite Wrestling's big event, All In, uh, that happened in at Wembley Stadium in, in the UK. It was like this huge event. And I talked a little bit about the, the ballad of CM Punk the pro wrestler who opened the show by getting into a fight with Luke Perry's son. And then, uh, I guess physically threatening his son of a billionaire boss behind closed doors, uh, before being fired a, a couple of weeks later. Uh, there'd been a lot of speculation from essentially the moment he was terminated that he would be returning to a world wrestling entertainment, the WWE, the, 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 the leader in, 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 in fake wrestling, you know, in fake stuff. Uh, this is a wrestler who spent a long time there and then very famously and very dramatically left the company in, at the beginning of 2014 uh, because he was just fed up with it. He'd been there for like a decade. He was really like fucking dunzo. And he, he, he ended up getting fired on his wedding day after kind of like walking away from things. It's kind of a long story. But if you're tangentially into wrestling, but you don't know this whole the whole lore of punk... Uh, you can look for his episode of his former best friend, Colt Cabana's podcast, The Art of Wrestling. And there's this giant episode that's just punk explaining to everybody why he walked away from WWE and like why he just went radio silence on people. And he tells his whole tale. And at the time, it was really, really dramatic. Some of the stuff in his story has been proven to be kind of like exaggerated or like not real based on a lawsuit that came out of it. Uh from a doctor at the WWE that was suing him with WWE's backing, obviously. And that lawsuit ended up financially sort of causing a rift between him and his friend. And I, I assume they've known they've been best friends for years. I imagine other things also, you know, straw that broke the camel's back type shit, but they don't, they don't fuck with each other anymore. And, uh, punk stayed away from wrestling for like seven years. He had a brief tenure in the UFC, uh, where he just got his ass beat a couple of times. He was not very good at it. But I guess kudos to him for trying, you know, uh, getting paid a lot of money to get the shit beat out of you. I don't think it's much worse than what most people do for a living, I guess, you know. Um, some days I feel like I would rather just get fucking punched in the head a lot than go to work. So, but anyway, he, uh, he was away from wrestling for like seven years. He did some other stuff. He wrote a couple of comics for Marvel. Uh, he wrote a Drax miniseries and, um. I think a couple of backup stories in a Thor book, maybe I never read any of them, honestly, but, uh, you know, he's, he's a, he's like a, he likes comics, likes lots of stuff in mm, late summer, early September, 2021, he returned to wrestling as a signee for all elite wrestling, which in many ways as a promotion, even though it was founded by people completely unrelated to punk. Much of what AEW stood for as this alternative to WWE and this sort of different, you know, take on, on wrestling as a genre or whatever, a lot of it was born of the ethos that he 
uh, sort of like stood for when he was in the WWE. He, he was, his entire character was sort of like this iconoclast, the voice of the voiceless, this sort of like revolutionary, like punk rock kind of guy who went against the grain and didn't, didn't roll with the way things were changing. He, he fought for a, a form of wrestling that he felt like wasn't really around anymore. It was kind of a throwback. And for years, there was this, this disaffected segment of the WWE audience that was very, very loyal to punk and really missed him. And they used to hijack shows. You know what I mean? Like he was not on, they would just chant his name and stuff. He didn't even work there anymore. And when they launched all Elite wrestling, basically all of the fans who were like, I hate WWE. I, I hate this. I'm sick of it. It's so sanitized it's for kids. All Elite was like for them, you know, all those people. And they, they went over there. So when they got punk, it was like, this is where he belongs you know, he should be here. This is like his real home because we care about stuff that he cares about. And there was, I mean, he played into it really well too, you know, uh, punk, you know, really enjoyed being the sort of the folk hero of these disaffected wrestling fans, the real wrestling fans. They were the real pro wrestling fans, not the guys that liked sports entertainment, you know, which is what, I mean, it's what Vince McMahon has been calling pro wrestling for like 25, 30, 30 years now. Uh, but, you know, a lot of wrestling fans use it as sort of a derogatory. Like, well, that's not it's sort of like, I don't know, film versus cinema versus movies, I guess, is the best way to describe it. You know, like you can say, well, this isn't cinema. Or that's not a film. That's a movie. But like it's both. And you're just being pretentious. It's kind of like that, I think, is the best way to describe that whole thing that happens where people are like WWE isn't wrestling. It's sports entertainment. But, uh, I remember distinctly in his, his return promo, he, he opened an episode of a show at, a United Center in Chicago, I want to say, and they sold out the arena and he was not even advertised. It was like a whisper campaign of like, we think punk's coming back. And that was enough to sell it an arena. And the show just opens up with, uh, his theme music hitting, which is, uh, cult of personality by in living color. At least it's like the his most famous theme music. He's he's come out to other songs in the past, and he came out and cut a long promo about you know missing wrestling and now he's back. And he specifically said this thing that's going to be important a little bit later here. He said uh, he named the date that he signed to, to WWE from the Indies from like Ring of Honor, and he said that he left pro wrestling that day and that now he's returning. That the entire time he was in WWE didn't count. Uh, because it wasn't real wrestling and now this is real wrestling this matters and people loved it they ate that shit up and i've been a pretty big cm punk fan since like high school uh the first uh independent wrestling show i ever went to technically i guess the second wrestling show i've ever been to i went to a to wwf survivor series 1995 uh when i was like nine or eight eight or nine um and then i don't think i went to a live wrestling show again until 2003 2004 and it was uh, in Glen Burnie, maryland a very small venue that no longer exists uh and cm punk was on that card it was a ring of honor show he was wrestling aj styles uh it was not a very good match i actually saw them wrestle live like two or three times and it was always not as good as their other matches like they just didn't have great in-ring chemistry tangent anyway uh, so I say that to say that I've got the bona fides to say that I've been a punk fan for a long time. But that night when he came back, I remember being happy that he was back because he seemed like stoked and stuff. And I thought that was cool. But I was really incensed by the the line about leaving pro wrestling when he was the WWE. And it bothered me because this was he said this in front of an arena of people who primarily know him from his time in the WWE. And a lot of AEW's core fan base pr presents themselves as being like real wrestling fans, the real diehard wrestling fans, not like those, you know, casual people that watch WWE, but many of them were not watching him when he was in Ring of Honor. And if he'd never come to WWE, I sincerely doubt he could have, you know, drawn this big a house. Do you know what I mean? Like so much of his most important work in his career happened there. Obviously, it was a contentious time, and he clearly regretted a lot of it and had issues there, as we all do at jobs. But I remember thinking, like, that just feels really disingenuous for you to say, like, that whole time doesn't count. Because there's so many people who are fans of his from there. Do you know what I mean? And they were there. They're in the building. So 
Anyway, he had a bit of a run there. Uh, it, it, the run itself only felt normal for like a year or so. Uh, he was older. He was kind of banged up. He couldn't wrestle quite the same way he used to. Um, his promos were largely good, but I don't know. There wasn't anyone there he, who really like was on his level in terms of character work and storytelling and stuff. So a lot of his matches were like whatever. Like there were some of them were good, some of them were bad, whatever. Uh, and it kind of came to this head where he finally like became champion over there and he had this like a lot of like backstage animosity with some of the people there. Uh, and it came to a head roughly a year. Yeah, I guess like a year after he, uh, he signed, um, they had a big event and at the end of it, they had like a press conference scrum and he just spent it running down the company and like all the things he hated about it there and like the people who were causing him problems. And then when the scrum was over, he went to his locker room and the people he was talking shit about came to the locker room and, 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 and there's different accounts of this, but like they essentially like ambushed him. Uh, they didn't attack him, but like, I guess they showed up in a manner that made him think they might attack him. So he just started swinging and he got into fights with like some wrestlers that he worked with who are, were also executive vice presidents. It was the young bucks. I think they brought a lawyer with them. Uh, his dog, the, like they kicked the door open and it like injured his dog, Larry, uh, his friend ended up biting Kenny Omega. It was a bunch of crazy shit. A lot of guys got suspended. Da, 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 da. There ended up being this sort of like in unfixable situation at, at that company with you have this guy, Punk, who's like their biggest draw, their biggest star. He sells the most merch. He, he hits the biggest ratings. And a bunch of the people in the company hate him and don't fuck with him and don't want to mediate with him. And he doesn't like those people either. And he got injured, luckily. So like he had some time to kind of be whatever. They ended up keeping him. They ended up bringing him back. They ended up uh, him getting hurt again, I believe. He got hit, injured like twice. And then when he came back the next time, he ended up uh, he ended up uh, getting his own show kind of like they made it a, a, a separate AW show called collision on Saturday nights. And it was like his thing. And that didn't last super long, obviously, because then at all in and, and Wembley, he ended up getting into another altercation with some coworkers that annoyed him and he got fired. So I figured the minute it happened, I was like, he'll go back to WWE. There's nowhere else for him to go. He can't go to any other smaller promotions or Japan or something because they're not going to pay him like what he's technically worth. Uh, He'll go back. I feel like there was a thing that happened last summer, this past summer, where he was at an episode of WWE Raw. Like he just showed up at the arena. It was a big deal. People were like, what is he doing there? He's under contract. This is not okay. And the minute that happened, I was like, he's definitely like trying to get home. You know, that's how I thought about it in my head. I called it home. And uh, there's been a lot of speculation the last several weeks. Like, is he coming? Has he been signed? What's going on? Da, 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 da. And then they had this really big show, Survivor Series, this year in Chicago. And it was like a sold out crowd. Like, I think they, I think it was like one of the, like their most lucrative shows in Chicago, like ever. And a lot of people thought, well, if he was going to return, here's where he'd do it. And I watched the show. This is this past Saturday night. It was a pretty damn good show. Uh, I liked most of the card. There weren't any matches I didn't like. Uh, but I remember it was that specter of, is he coming was kind of hanging over the whole thing, you know? Cause it was like, it didn't make sense, like where they would do it, how they would do it. Like it would, if he came out at the beginning of the show, derail the whole show, if he got in the middle of the show, it'd be weird. He, he didn't seem like there'd be a reason for him to come out at the end of the show. Cause it wasn't related to any of the storylines that were currently going on. And the main event show of the show was really, really good. And I thought really masterful at the men's, uh, war games match. War games is like a, uh, um, a, a gimmick match where there's like two rings and a cage over the both rings and two different teams fight and they it's a whole thing it's like it traces back to like the 80s whatever uh but it was really good good thing whole really great stuff randy orton another famous wrestler came back he'd been injured for a while it started to seem like he was not going to ever return and he, he was healthy and he came back and it was really cool at the very end of the show it was kind of like you know what this is good enough that we don't we didn't need the punk return if he's coming back, he can come back some other show. Who cares? Whatever. This was really good. This was strong on its own. Really well done. You know, really satisfying, you know? And then he did come back at the very, very end, like two minutes at the very end of the show. He just came out. They played his music. He looked really happy. He looked healthier than he did the last time we saw him. Uh, this one guy was just like hugging the shit out of him. He looked like he could not. He's like, dude, you gotta let me, you gotta let me go. It's crazy. But it was really cool. It was a crazy moment. We all popped. It was great. 
And then it was like, now we got two days of he's going to show up on Monday Night Raw. What's that going to be like? Is he going to cut a promo? Is he going to say things about the company? Is he going to talk shit about them? And I think they thought he was going to talk shit about them. So it seemingly, they seemingly rallied like their roster to like tweet good things about working there. Like we love AEW. If it wasn't for AEW, I'd be sucking dick down at the wharf. You know, I'm so grateful for them or what have you. And it all built up to this big episode of Monday Night Raw. And the episode was like fine. It actually wasn't one of the better Raws of the year or anything. But it built up to him coming at the end of the show. And he cut a little promo uh, saying that he was home. And that he he wanted to come back here a long time. And he just, you know, couldn't admit it to himself and stuff. And a lot of people hated the fucking promo. There's two things kind of wrong with the promo. Thing one is that it was a three-hour show. Raw is a three-hour show. I always wish it was shorter. But it's been three hours for a very long time. They're never going to make it shorter. And the sheer number of long shows that come on, if you're a wrestling fan, you would watch three hours of Raw Monday night. Tuesday night, you watch two hours of NXT. Wednesday night, you'd watch two hours of Dynamite. Thursday night, you can watch two hours of Impact. Then Friday, you watch two hours of SmackDown. And then Saturday, you watch two hours of Collision. Uh, this is between these three different companies. And then I guess technically Friday nights, they also have like an hour long show. AEW does, but it sucks. So who cares? So if you watch a lot, it's a lot. It's easy to like not watch all of them. And it's also easy to go. I have watched like six plus hours of wrestling three weeks in a row. I'm taking a break. I just don't fucking feel like it, which I think is normal. But Raw was fine. It was just that you waited three hours to see this guy come out. He came out and he cut a pretty short promo. And I believe the show was slightly mistimed or something. So like he had less time at the end. There wasn't an overrun and it was Literally just him coming out and being like, I'm back because I love the fans. I love you guys. And I'm, I, I want to, you know, it's very, very positive, very raw, raw. And to a lot of people, really fake. And there's a couple of different schools of thought on this. One school of thought is that Punk needs the money and he has nowhere else to go. So he made a deal with the devil, this place that he hated. And in his, in his uh, AW debut promo, he said he could never get healthy in the place that made him sick in the first place. Basically saying he had to leave WWE to get in a better mind state. He could never go back there. And here he is back there calling it home. And people are like, you fake bitch. You lying ass bitch. Sorry, I don't, the people were like, people were very angry on Twitter. People were getting very emotional. And they uh, were really like, I don't know. I felt like people felt betrayed. I think a lot of people expected him to co come out and like just speak bit hellfire about his former company and bury them and say bad things about them and when he didn't it was like fuck that's it now i gotta pick apart his incredibly simple and basic i'm happy to be her promo and i understand the people that thought it was disingenuous um i get that and people are like he's a hypocrite and i'm like well if you followed sam punk forever like most of us he's kind of always been a hypocrite he's always contradicted himself he's always you know his his sort of folk hero voice the voiceless thing has always been sort of kind of self-serving there's always been stories about him being someone who thought of himself as being like a compassionate leader that other people just thought was kind of a dick you know what i mean like it's uh he's he's always been kind of a contentious figure but i think something changed in his public perception because for all the issues he had, he had in wwe he never like got into fights with anybody. He got into fights with guys in the Indies before he came there, but he didn't ever fight anybody at the WWE. And it's also because the company is just more structured and corporate and that wouldn't have fl flown. But AEW ended up getting like two separate big fights. It was a big deal. And people were like, he's unsafe. He's dangerous. He's toxic. He's a cancer. He's a Scorpio, actually. He's a, like, a, like a quadruple Scorpio. I mean, he's got like a Scorpio stellium. But he, you know, had now has his reputation as being this guy who's incredibly difficult to work with. And it was like, how can he, how is WWE going to work? Like pe people there don't want him there. Oh my God, there's all this controversy. And now look, now he's just going to be a fake sanitized version of himself. Who wants to watch that? And me, I just want to watch him in general. I mean, I managed to watch a bunch of his stuff in AEW that I thought was like kind of neutered and boring. Um, even though he got to bleed and like cuss a little bit, you know, I still thought it was kind of like, eh, this is fine. So of course I want to watch him here where like they'll be, they can actually light the entire crowd because the arena's not empty and stuff like that. And I think Mark Henry, who a uh, former like Olympian, I think used to, they used to call him the world's strongest man. He holds a lot of records for 
powerlifting and stuff. Mark Henry is pretty he's pretty friendly with Punk. He actually works at AEW. He used to work at WWE for a long time. He talked about the promo and he basically said, you know, to me, you know, it felt like he got his heart broken in WWE, you know, and if you ever had a really bad breakup, you kind of hate that person. You want to like demonize them and like get yourself as far away from them as possible. But you only feel that way. You're only that passionate about it because ultimately you still care on some level, you know? And I think it's hard for people to accept that maybe when he returned to AEW on a deeper level, he wanted to return to WWE and it just didn't work out. And I don't know if, if, I don't know if that's like a thing, like maybe he tried or whatever, but like, it's pretty clear to me that like, I think he probably wanted to go back before any of this stuff happened. So I don't think it's fair to go. Well, he has no choice but to go back there now. I'm like, yeah, I think he wanted to before. Uh, and I re-listened to the podcast, uh, the art of wrestling podcast with Colt about all his stuff and listening to it now, like with hindsight and stuff, it was the first time I'd listened to it in full, probably since it first dropped in like 2015 or whatever. But, uh, at the time I listened to it, I was working for this company that I work for now, but in 2016 I left, uh, pretty angrily. I was really, I, I was really fed up with the company. I was really disgusted by a lot of things and I was very like, wow, whatever. And I was, I was a full blown alcoholic. I was just drinking every fucking goddamn day and I was in a bad place. And I kind of blamed a lot of stuff on the company because I hated it at the time. I felt very stifled. I felt like I was never getting credit for my work. I felt like I was, I could never get a break. It was all these things that like I realize now being older that a lot of people feel that way about a lot of their jobs. And listening to Punk talk about his issues at WWE, there were a couple of issues that were like definitely bigger, bigger deals. But most of it, you know, he would talk about ideas he had that other people took credit for. He would talk about not getting to take breaks. He would talk about feeling disillusioned and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that was like me when I was there. And I left. I went, I went to another company for a little bit. And it was an improvement in some ways to me. Like immediately there were certain quality of life benefits. Uh, but I also gotten sober. So like some of the things that were better were not the job. It was like, I don't drink every day. I'm watching what I eat. I'm losing weight. I'm on antidepressants for the first time in my entire adult life. Uh, and then the longer I was there, the more I was like, oh, this place fucking sucks too. It just sucks like different. It's just like a different kind of suck. And that kind of opened my eyes to being like, you know what? A lot of the shit this other company did is not that bad by comparison. I kind of get it now. I felt like I had, you know, a, a different perspective. And later I ended up going back. Uh, I was pretty fucking desperate at the time that I went back, obviously. But um, when I went back, I felt just very different. A, a lot of things that used to bother me didn't bother me quite as much anymore. Um, you know, I knew how to navigate things better. I just had more perspective. It was like a better time, I guess. Uh, I'm still with that company now. And, uh, now I have just very different issues with them, uh, over time. Cause a lot of whatever, I'm not getting that shit, but, uh, listening to punk then I was like, you know, I would never call this company like my fucking home or something like that. But I made a lot of very close, very long lasting friendships working there. I, I, I learned a lot. It's, it's been an, an important part of my life and not to compare the two things necessarily, but to me, if I went someplace and I just had to act like I never spent years there. I didn't meet many of my best friends there. I didn't, you know, this wasn't a huge part of my life. It would just be like a lie. So listening to Punk talk about being home, to me, it didn't read as like disingenuous or fake. I think he really did. He seemed happy. Now, who knows? Maybe in a few months or something, things will go sour or whatever. A lot of people are damn sure fucking praying on that to happen. They've been very, very negative online. But... I'm just kind of excited. I don't know. Like he, it's, he's, 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 I, I like him. He's a wrestler. I like, he's definitely washed physically. Like he's not going to be able to do some of the things he used to do, but I think WWE is a lot better at hiding people's weaknesses. They're a lot better at, um, focusing on people's strengths and, and, and presenting people in a, in a, in a positive, in the right light. So I'm excited to see what they do. I'm, I'm actually very stoked. Uh, and then watching AEW's episode that like had, some stuff that was sort of like an, like a, like a, a, like a response or retaliation to a promo that punk didn't cut. Like he just ignored them. He just acted like they didn't exist in his promo. And they took a couple of jabs at him on the show. And I just remember thinking like, you guys, this whole product needs to get better at 
they have so many a lot of fans i think really characterized all the problems with AEW as being centered around punk if we get punk out of here everything will get better but he's gone and things have gotten worse and they've had a lot of issues for a long time that they're just not addressing and not dealing with and this is a company i want to see succeed i'm a big believer in labor and i'm a big believer in like if there's more than one big money corp company in pro wrestling that means that like more people wrestlers have more places to go and make real money you know if you get fired from the wwe for whatever reason you don't have to go back to the indies or like go abroad there's someplace else you can go and make big money and be on national television so i would like for that company to succeed i just don't like the way they do a lot of things i i, I think the leadership is is not is not doing a lot of the right stuff i think that there's just a lot of problems with it and the thing that makes me so frustrated about them is that they, they're like critique proof so many of these diehard wrestling fans spent years watching every WWE show and every pay-per-view and every event and then just complaining about it online ceaselessly, nitpicking every little thing. And now there's this other company and it's been four years since it launched. Four years isn't a long time necessarily, but there's a lot of things that we can't chalk up to their new company anymore. It's like, by now they should have figured some of this shit out. But if you ever point any of that out online, a lot of their diehard fans are just like, that's in bad faith. You don't even watch the show. You just love WWE. You just want to see them fail. And it's like, why is this promotion uh, not allowed to be criticized? Why are you never allowed to, you know, there was a, Tony Khan is like the, uh, he, he owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, I think. His dad's like super rich and stuff. He did a, a press uh, conference after one of the recent shows. And people were kind of criticizing him online for like, you know, you guys always said the show was going to have a more sports based presentation of pro wrestling, but you've been doing a lot of quote unquote sports entertainment type stuff. You've been doing a lot of stuff like WWE, like cartoony, like funny, goofy shit. And he said some stuff about they're doing this big wrestling tournament now called the Continental Classic. And he was like, if you like sports based product, then you need to put your fucking money where your mouth is and watch this. And it was like someone responded to this on Twitter with like, Hey bro, I just spent $50 on this pay-per-view and it sucked. I did put my money where my mouth is and you gave me a load of shit, you know? And it's, it's this thing. I've said this to friends before, but I feel like I don't want to get too like political about it, but like a lot of the way the AEW operates in terms of fandom feels to me like the modern democratic party where it's like, if you criticize it because you want it to get better, you actually want the bad guys to win. Do you know what I mean? It's like you can never just kind of say, hey, I kind of have some issues with this. I'm, I'm all for it. I support it, but I'd like it to get better. It's like, fuck you. You're in the way. You know, you're a problem. Um, and I feel like when just like sort of the Democratic Party, when they fuck up or they have failure or losses, they're often reframed as like, well, you failed the party. The party cannot fail its constituents or its voters. It's like the voters can fail the party by not sufficiently supporting it. And AEW feels like that. It's like, if you have issues with it, it's your fucking fault. Like you should do this. You should figure this out. And it just always rubbed me the wrong way. I never liked it. There's like this sense of gatekeeping. Do you know, like these fans have this sense of like, Hey, sometimes you guys present wrestlers that have never been on national television before that you would only know if you follow these independent promotions or you follow international product. Uh, maybe you guys should make it easier for regular people to watch that aren't tired wrestling fans to like know the, the things about these guys and people are like just fucking google it grow up you don't know just look it up on youtube they have the matches on youtube and it's like yeah they have matches on youtube but this is a nationally televised product you could have someone watching who's never watched before god forbid you make them feel at home or make them feel welcome and they make fun of the fact that wwe always in their mind spoon feeds people things that's like they think their fans are so dumb they can't figure any of this out on their own and it's like well, I mean, no, it's just that, Hey, someone might be watching that doesn't know who this is. It's, you're just, it's just television. You're just, you want people to understand what's happening. So I'm just been kind of, I don't know. I made the mistake this week of, because I was watching wrestling as sort of a comfort thing. Cause it's something I don't have to write about or critique or whatever, or engage in or make content about. It can be a little more relaxing for me, but I kept making the fucking foolhardy mistake of wanting to like engage with it more and talk to people about it and then go on the internet and then there's just a bunch of people who are very stupid and annoying who share a lot of like very dumb opinions and i should have been smarter and better about exposing myself to that level of idiocy 
but I wasn't and I didn't. And I think it's a big mistake that I made this week. I don't know if this is a value to any of the listeners or watchers or viewers, but it's like, you know, your time is precious and you got to protect it more than I do clearly. And, um, you know, I could enjoy wrestling and like it. I just maybe got to stay off of these X posts on Twitter and stuff. Maybe don't end up on Reddit like a dummy. Don't read any YouTube comments. Maybe just watch what I watch. Talk about it with my friends. I don't even care if that means I'm staying in a bubble or whatever. But I have friends that can talk about this stuff where we can disagree comfortably and it's not weird. There's no tribalism. There's no animosity. I should stick to those rivers and lakes that I'm used to is what I learned. But part of it was like, you know, it's cool that I'm entrenched in all this because the only movie I went to see this week was The Iron Claw. The A24 film, Sean Durkin. It's a movie about the tragedy of the Von Erich family. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there is an episode of the Vice show, Dark Side of the Ring, about the Von Erichs. That is very good, and I will admit is more informative and shorter than The Iron Claw. So if you just kind of want to know about that story, maybe before you see the movie or whatever, you can watch that episode. It's actually pretty damn good. The movie, uh, the director, Sean Durkin, is... He's, he's, I think he's clearly like a wrestling fan, but you can tell he was primarily more interested in just following the, the tragedy of this, this family of wrestlers raised by a wrestler, uh, in Texas. And they were like, you know, on fire and they were a big deal. They were local celebrities, international celebrities actually, because their, their, uh, their, their, their product was aired on like ESPN and stuff. So people outside of Texas saw them, but many of them died. It's like a, it's like a family of like four four sons and like only one of them lived and in, in sorry in the movie it's four sons in in real life it was like actually five i think uh there's an entire brother who died that they just don't have in the movie because structurally it would be too hard to tell a story involving him like his life is almost an inconvenience to screenplay structure i guess so that's a little bit weird seeing a movie that just cuts that shit out but uh the performances are pretty good. I'm not, I mean, I'm not reviewing it right now, but like I, I liked it. Uh, I saw it with my homie Cody and we both thought it was like pretty good, but there's like a lot of, in some ways the movie is really lyrical and like well done and really sincere and very heartfelt, pretty crowd pleasing at times too. Like it knows there's going to be a lot of heavy shit. So when there's time for levity, they, they really kind of punch it up. But I thought the movie was going to be a bigger phenomenon because I thought it was going to be like really critically acclaimed, especially by people who aren't big wrestling fans. Because like it's an easier movie to digest if you don't come in with preconceived notions of being a fan and knowing the history. But based on the reaction from the other critics in our screening, I don't think it's going to be as well, well received, to be entirely honest. Not that that matters to me, but like I think the movie is not going to be as big a, as, a, a, as big of a deal as a lot of us hoped. Uh, so I won't get into too much about the movie other than to say that like the cast is all pretty good. The score is good. The cinematography is good. Like a lot of things about the movie are nice, but there are two people in the movie who are so bad that it like stopped me stone. I've never, I don't think I've had this happen in a movie in a very long time, but there are two famous NWA world heavyweight champions who figure into the story of the Von Erics. One is Harley race, uh, RIP. And one is Ric Flair, who somehow is, is never going to die. And the guy they get to play Harley Race is fucking awful. Like, even if I didn't know the real Harley Race and I hadn't seen his matches and listened to him speak before, I would be like, why? How did this guy get in this fucking movie? Like, it, it feels like a like an I think you should leave sketch in the middle of this otherwise very serious drama. And then the guy they get to play Ric Flair is like. He. His his first scene is essentially him cutting word for word a real Ric Flair promo. Like if you're an, a fan or an, and a nerd, you recognize it immediately. He got all the words right, but his performance and his his take is so to me awful. And again, I was like, you you could have just not shown this. You know what I mean? Like there's there's so many other things about pro wrestling that they kind of shy away from or don't dig into because the the drama with the family is more important for this film. But no, there's just parts where I was like, you could have got this. We could have made this story work without any of this. But like, no, now I got to watch this horrendous shit. And it was bad enough to make me like other parts of the movie less. And I feel like if I see it a second time, 
I might like it more because I won't have the shock to my system of seeing this fucking terrible, terrible dude. Here's the funny thing. He's actually terrible in the couple of scenes he has. And then he has this one moment at, right before he leaves the film entirely where he's playing Rick backstage after a match. And for this one 40 se- seconds piece of screen time, he's actually very good. And it's twofold. You don't see his face very well in the way this scene is shot and blocked. And he captures like so much of what we know about Ric Flair to be like the way, like his level of hedonism and all these different things about him. I was like, man, if this was the only part of this guy we saw, I would go, that guy's amazing. But because I see the rest of it, I'm like, this is bad. You should have cut this shit. It's so bad. So the Iron Claw, if you are a wrestling person, you're looking forward to it. I think you'll probably still like it, but um, temper your expectations. I will be doing a video about that in the near future. I have like five movies that I've seen that I haven't made videos for because some of them have like weird embargoes and stuff because of the way fall and winter award season releases go. Uh, And then a couple that I completely missed the embargo, whatever. I'm probably going to be putting out a video next week that is just a compendium of shorter reviews. Um, I've been thinking about how not every movie I want to review needs to have like an entire long video and how I, you know, if this was like a column I had, there are certain weeks where I would probably just have several blurbs, you know? So I've been thinking about doing that. I'm not sure if, if, or how I will quite yet, but I, if that's something you guys are willing to see, let me know in the comments uh, or message me or something. If you think it's fucking dumb and you don't want to watch a video that has like four movie reviews in it, you can also tell me that too. Um, I will probably end up doing what I want to do regardless, but the feedback is obviously appreciated and I would like it. But yeah, that's, that's all I watched this week. I watched some TikToks. I, um, (laughs) uh, my friend Cyrus, uh, sends me more TikToks than anyone else in my life. And sometimes I'll just forget about opening TikTok if I have a busy few days and then I'll get one night where I go and I'm like, oh man, I have 90 new TikToks from Cyrus. And by the time I get to them, I don't know, seven of them have been like taken off the platform for violating whatever, but they're always good. He, he's, um, he's remarkable at, uh, at sharing funny stuff and knowing exactly how to pop you specifically. Like he really knows what you think is funny versus his other friends. And, um, I don't know. I just want to shout out Cyrus for being so good at sharing TikToks. I don't know. It's, um, Sometimes I feel bad. I'm like, damn, I've let this shit pile up. I got, I got to catch up. And then sometimes the catch up is the best part. You're like waiting for like a week or two. And then you're like, no, I got a fucking hundred videos to watch. I don't have to go through the algorithm. Cyrus has got me. And he's a, he's a great guy. He, I, I love Cyrus. Uh, I don't think I watched anything else. No, I didn't. That's, that's basically it. Yeah. So, um, that's the end of the, what we watch section. It, uh, me ranting about pro wrestling. Um, if you, I don't know if you're listening to this and you actually like, like wrestling and you want to hear more of me talking about it, maybe I'll figure out some kind of outlet for that. I don't want to make it a thing where I start writing about wrestling and stuff like that, but I don't know, maybe like once a month or something, I'll do like a video about it or I don't know. Making content about wrestling is really hard because of all the copyright shit, but, um, I don't know. I'll think about it if, if there's an interest in it, if, if that's something you guys like, so Holler at your boy. Well, I don't, why did I say that? I never fucking say that. Uh, all right, well, let's just get into the home stretch and let's talk about some questions. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Question one from my friend, John Armstrong. Uh, John asks, Q for next time. Is it better to patronize movie theaters on holidays or not? If people want to go, then service workers have to be scheduled and don't get time with their own families but maybe they could use the extra hours sub Q Do movie theater workers get extra pay for holiday hours. If people are scheduled anyway, is it better to give theaters the business or to not add to the workload? I feel a little bit bad about this because I think I was whining in the last episode that I filmed on Thanksgiving about having to go to work. And every time I work uh, a Thanksgiving or a Christmas or whatever, there's a part of me that always goes in with this weird existential dread of like, I kind of hate it. I, I've worked a lot of holidays. I don't mind it in the sense that I would prefer me to go if other people on my team can take time off and see their families and do things. I haven't, I love their family members in my family that I love, obviously, but I have not had a family unit that does things like that in a very long time. 
So I, I always look at it as, you know what, you know, one of the girls on my management team, uh, she's got a great family that love her and are very supportive. And anytime she comes to me and she's like, Hey, is it okay if I take a few days off and go see my folks? I'm like, yes, because you will go and you'll have a beautiful time. You're going to come back rejuvenated. It'll be very good for you. You deserve that. Uh, obviously in some of the situations, it means I'll work a double or I'll work long, longer hours or something, but it's like, what was I going to do anyway? I'd just be at home watching movies or something. I'm not going to go see anybody or share pie or whatever the fuck. So I complain, but it's just, it's, it's, I'm not mad at the theater. I'm not mad at working on a holiday. I'm more mad that like, I don't know, I'm mad that I don't have that anymore. It's been a very long time since I've had like the go home to your family and do things thing in my life, I guess. Uh, so that's, if you ever see me publicly whining about this, that's really all it is. I'm not actually that mad at capitalism for a change. It's more just like, bleh, kind of wish I was going someplace where they were making really good mac and cheese, you know? And then it's like, I don't want to fucking do it myself. I'm not a bad cook. I'm actually a pretty good cook. I just don't enjoy doing it. So it's just like, bleh. anyway, to answer your actual questions, John, um, I'm of the mind that like, okay, when I was younger and I was, I had less responsibilities for the business. I was definitely on the wave of like, I wish these people would fucking leave. Oh my God, go home to Hulu, leave me alone. But now that I'm responsible for a business and like our numbers and things are very important because they allow me to keep other people employed and make them, keep them taken care of. I care more and I do want people to come to the movies. And also it's like, there's not going to be enough people to get together and stop going to the movies on these days that it'll change. So they'll always be open and yeah, you may as well go. And I say that for this reason, I very firmly believe in movie theaters as being a really good haven, like a really good safe place people can go to. And even though on those holidays for me, it's not like a haven or a safe place. It's like, it sucks. (laughs) It feels better at the end of the day to know that people could come and feel safe. Do you know what I mean? And feel like uh, at home kind of, uh, sometimes people come in and it's with their families and it's like on Thanksgiving, there's a part of the day where like, all right, people have eaten, they have nothing to do. They can't go shopping yet. They're going to come see a fucking movie. Like, Oh my God, get out of the house. They're probably arguing. Someone probably brought up, brought up, uh, you know, pronouns in front of their shitty uncle or something. It's, it's going to be bad. Let's go, let's go watch Napoleon. Right. So that's, I think an important service to people. And the other part of it is, there are people, like I said, who don't have families to go see or they're estranged or their families suck. That happens to a lot of people. And when I see single people or people by themselves come in, I always want to make sure they feel really good. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if I'm in a bad mood, even if I don't want to be there, if I'm grouchy and grumpy, um, it's super important to me that people can come to the movies. And I've been going to the movies on days like that my entire life. Do you know what I mean? So like on, on some level it's very important to be able to pay that forward, you know? Oh, and, uh, oh yes. And I don't know about every chain, but I know we pay holiday pay. Uh, we pay like the floor staff get like time and a half. And then if you're like senior management or above or salaried or whatever, you get like double pay or something. Um, and oh, we also, I mean, we feed them too, which is like on New Year's Christmas and Thanksgiving, if you have to make your staff work and there's fucking nothing else open because it's a holiday, you become responsible for feeding them. And um, that can be hard. I mean, because it's like you have to feed a lot of people and you're not allotted very much money from corporate. And it's like you don't want to get everybody fucking pizza on Thanksgiving. But pizza is, I mean, all the memes about, you know, the office pizza party or whatever. Uh, when morale is down, it's just an easy thing to buy a group of people because you can pick a number of slices per person and do math and figure out how many pizzas you need to get. If you need to get like Thai food for like 25 people, it's not quite as easy and it's really annoying. And every time I've ever been convinced to have us order something like Thai food, everyone ends up being very mad that I did it. They're like, oh, we should just got pizza. I'm like, that's what I was going to fucking do. But um, I think last year we did we did Popeyes. We got Popeyes for everybody. There's Popeyes open. And that was actually pretty rad. We got like a good amount of food. Um, but no, I, I, I firmly believe, look, everyone, if you ever see or hear theater workers bitching about their job, I don't think any of them want you to not go. I don't think any theater people want everyone to stop going to the movies. You know what I mean? A lot of it's just like, 
I don't know the way people who work in offices complain about getting emails, you know, my e- I mean, I get a lot of emails too, actually, but I'm saying like my complaining about emails is like, you know, someone calling me and being like, are you sure you're open? Like, ma'am, do you think I'm just here for fucking fun? Do you really think that I'm just here for this? And to be honest, uh, this Thanksgiving people were largely very nice. We mostly had pretty cool people. I had this one lady who was rude as fuck to me on the phone. It was late. It was like at nine o'clock. She called me and was asking me some annoying questions and being really nasty. And in my head, I was just like, man, it is nine 15 on Thanksgiving. What the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you talking to me like this? You know, but otherwise everybody was pretty cool. People were nice. We did good numbers. It was like a, it was like a good week. Thanks, John. That's actually a very good question. Questions. Um, next. Ooh, fuck. <laughs> next question. Um, God damn it. I think I actually just like fucking deleted part of this question. Whatever. Okay. Kyle, homie. Hi, Kyle. Uh, question for the episode, for the next episode. What are some of your favorite weight they were in slash did that pieces of movie trivia? One of mine is the fact that Jim Dangle and Junior from Reno 911 wrote the nine at the night of the museum movies. Uh, and that, oh yeah. Okay. I, I don't, I accidentally delete part of your question, but he was also saying, how I can't remember the cinematographer's name, but that a famous cinematographer also worked on Ilsa She Wolf of the SS, which is crazy. And then he said, Oh, and also the most insane piece of trivia you taught me that Rivers Cuomo helped write Cold's song Stupid Girl. So when Kyle sent this question in last week, I don't my memory is kind of like not as good as it should be, or it's mostly populated by complete unimportant things. I forgot that I, I guess I told you that, and I forgot it happened either. So I had to go relook it up. And then I went to listen to Stupid Girl, which is like one of my favorite songs by Cold. Um, and like remembering that Rivers helped write this song, you can just hear it as a Weezer song, like a heavier Weezer song. Like like if you if you don't are not familiar with the band Cold and you never heard Stupid Girl, but you know who Weezer is, look up Stupid Girl by Cold and just think about Rivers Cuomo the whole time. It's a very funny experience. Uh, I feel like that's something that happens a lot with like, for me with like rap music, like in hip hop when like certain big name, uh, rappers, it, there used to be like a, a holy trinity of people that had ghost writers. Uh, it was Diddy monster and Dr. Dre, uh, and Will Smith. You know, they, they, there came a point in Will Smith's career where like he didn't have time to write his fucking own raps. He was a movie star. So he would hire other people too. And there's a lot of guys in rap who are like exclusively kind of like ghostwriters, their their main hustle, but there were also big name rappers who would ghostwrite for people. So like, you know, Dr. Dre has songs that Eminem ghostwrote for him. Uh, I think my favorite Dre example is, um, still DRE, like Jay Z wrote that. And like, once you hear that and you listen to it, you can hear how that's like hit the, the flow and stuff. You can hear Jay Z writing that or, uh, uh, like common, I think I don't remember common wrote a song for Will Smith, but I don't remember which one it is. And I think Nas wrote, I think Nas wrote Miami. So if anyone remembers specifically, you can say in the comments, but, um, once you hear those things, you listen to the song and you're like, I can fucking picture it. You know, it's kind of fun. I don't know. Uh, I sort of feel that way too about, uh, movies that have script doctoring by specific writers who only worked on one or two scenes and it sticks out. Like uh, Quentin Tarantino's work on Crimson Tide. Watch that movie and you don't have to be told which scene he wrote. It's going to be very obvious to you. Uh, There's other examples of that sort of thing too, but I think that's fun. Uh, uh, The one I wrote down actually for this question is actually pretty funny because I just saw a meme about this unrelated. Uh, I went to see the movie 12 Strong uh, a few years ago because I was reviewing it. And it might be more than a few years now. I don't, time's not, I'm not good at it. But uh, it's like a military movie. I just remember like these guys having to go save some people or whatever. Chris Hemsworth in it. I remember they were on horseback. I don't remember the movie very well. But in the movie, they introduce this one like military officer, and it's fucking Rob Riggle, like the comedic actor. And I was like, what the fuck is Rob Riggle doing in this movie? Oh my god, why? And it, well, on the one hand, I was like, is this like supposed to be a funny casting, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What I didn't know until I went to go write my review was that Rob Riggle used to be a marine. And not only did Rob Riggle used to be a Marine, he was pl- the guy he was playing in the movie, because it's based on a true story, is a guy he served under. He got to play his former CEO in this movie. And he was not bad at it. I like Rob Riggle. I mean, I kind of wish he did, I don't really wish he did more serious work, but if he did, I think he'd be good at it, I guess. 
um, that was a roller coaster for me of being like, why is Rob Riggle in this? Rob Riggle's a Marine. Rob, you know, just, it was, you know, crazy. Um, really good question. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, the homie Rob Secundus asks question for next time. What are some other adaptations you enjoy that both a feel very devoted to the source material, but also b take a huge divergence from that source material. The big one that comes to mind for me is the recent little women and its decision to reframe the book's weird ending to bring in Louise uh, May Alcott's biography a bit more to the end. Okay. So I fucking love Greta Gerwig's little women. And, um, I, have never read the book Little Women, and I'd never seen any other adaptations of Little Women. So I went to a press screening of it at the Chinatown Gallery, uh, at the Chinatown Regal, uh, and it was like in the morning, and it was like really rainy. And I love Greta, so I was like, this will probably be good. I don't like costume shit, I don't like period pieces and stuff like that. Like it has to be really good for me to get over the fact that there's horses and carriages. Um, but making that movie non-linear was, I think, such, I don't know if the, I don't think the book is obviously, but like, I thought it added so much to the story. It was, it made everything so much richer and more engaging. And like they, they, was, they were able to mine so much drama from like the juxtaposition of the different time periods and stuff. I loved that about Little Women. And um, I, I think I've talked about this before. I, everyone loves this. Uh, I didn't know when they kept referring to their dad in the movie, like the father of these girls, uh, because it was nonlinear. I just assumed he died at the war. I figured we'd never see him because I don't remember them announcing who was playing him. I didn't know the story. So I figured we were, I was waiting for a scene of like, your father didn't make it. And I was like, oh, that sucks. But no, the father makes it and he comes home and it's fucking Bob Odenkirk. And he jumps into the screen and just says, my little women. And to me, that is the greatest moment in cinema history. Like I ascended in that moment. Like you couldn't have made a, a scene more for me. You know, Bob Odenkirk pops up in the middle of this classical adaptation of like a whatever and says the title of them, everything about it was like, great. Um, I'm actually a little bit mad because this is a good question, but that's like you basically picked the best example of what you're talking about. I can't think of a better one. Um, I think sometimes, not the whole movie, obviously, but I think about like Zack Snyder's Watchmen, which I haven't rewatched recently, but I remember really being impressed by all the Dr. Manhattan stuff in that it's the only part of the movie to me where like, I'm not a big fan of that brief period of time when because of Sin City and stuff, it was like, if you want to make a comic book movie, just use the pages as storyboards and make it just like the comic. And people love screenshots of, look at this. This is just like this panel. They love that shit. Not a big fan of it. But I liked that Zack Snyder found a way to do, what is it, issue six of Watchmen, I think? To do that sequence, like the whole, the time distillation stuff with Dr. Manhattan in a way that felt more natural to the way uh, movies work versus the way the comic book page works. I think that's a pretty good example, honestly. Not as good as Little Women. Sorry, Zach. You're no Greta. But uh, I did like that about that specific thing. I remember arguing with my friends about it in a Borders parking lot after seeing it at the Regal Cinema Countryside 20 RIP. And uh, I remember uh, we argued so hard about that movie. I don't remember any of our viewpoints or perspectives, but man, that was crazy. But yeah, that's my that's my answer, I guess. Thanks, Rob. Rob's really cool. He's a really, really smart guy. Uh, and then finally, my friend Fatira asks, uh, well, she was actually fucked with me first about me not watching enough anime. And and like, look, Fatira, a couple of their friends have people who are always like, you gotta watch this series, you gotta watch this series. I promise at some point I will fix my life in such a way where I will have more room to watch some of these series that I trust you all must be good. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm awful. But anyway, actual question back in the heyday of torrenting, was there ever a movie you wanted to see so badly that you had to resort to some really terrible cam rip slash some version with huge burned in subs, etc. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I have a pretty good answer for this. I really, really years ago, wanted to see, uh, Wong Kar Wai's fallen angels. Um, I'd seen chunking. And I'd seen In the Mute Mood for Love. And I, I guess by that point, I'd see 2046. Um, I remember distinctly 
scene 2046 at my friend Chad Bruce's house. And it, it, I, it, that movie felt like 30 years long. And I liked Wong Kar Wai and stuff at the time already, but like it, something about that movie, I was like, how is it this long? It takes forever. And uh, I, I, we both kept falling asleep, I feel like it was whatever. But um, before I went back and I ended up later seeing like Days of Being Wild and all this early stuff, and then I, I think the only movie I was missing for a while was Happy Together. I think that might have been the final, my final Wong Kar Wai movie. Uh, but there was a period where I wanted to see Fallen Angels so bad because I knew it was sort of a companion piece to Chunking. I love Chunking. And at the time, I don't remember if it had had like a good physical release anywhere. And at the time, I was very over collecting physical media anyway. And I remember trying to torrent the movie and it was like when I had a really shitty laptop and where I was living at the time, did not have a very good internet. Everything about this was like making this an insurmountable mission. But I did get the movie. And I remember it was like this really strange... Uh, it was just really strange, like transfer or something. And like, it did have hard subs, but they were not good. They were like, I don't know if they were like fan translated or something, but they were really rough to the point that I kept having to go and like read things about the movie to make sure I was interpreting scenes correctly. Luckily, so much of what makes that movie good is like the visuals and the mood and the tone. So my first time watching it, I was like, I think this is good, but I'm not sure. Um, I ended up watching it several times later in life and loving it, obviously. But that first time I remember it took like, it didn't have a lot of seeds. It took like days, like days to download. And I just remember wanting to watch it so bad. Do you know what I mean? Like nowadays you, piracy has gotten harder again, but like, you know, there is a sense of like, Hey, I remember this movie. You're a few keystrokes away from just getting that movie back. You know what I mean? Whether if you don't want to pay for it. And I don't have room in this episode or the mental capacity to talk about the ethics of piracy. I don't really care, actually. But I will say at the time, you know, it was harder to get a hold of a movie like that digitally. And sometimes you really did have to just like fucking wait. You'd be staring at that little bar and shit and ugh, difficult. But Fallen Angels rules. So it was worth the wait. Thank you, Fatura. Beautiful, beautiful question. Uh, I guess that's all the questions. for the, That's everything. That's, that's, the, that's the episode. Okay. Uh, I want to first say <laughs> thank you for indulging my long rambling about pro wrestling. I appreciate that. Um, thank you guys for, I know some of our episodes are a little less structured than others and stuff. And, uh, there are these weeks where I keep thinking, is this going to be the week I finally decided to take a week off or something? But I don't know, 21 weeks in a row feels really special. And I did, I, I'm recording this very late in the day. It's been a very long day. I'm glad that I recorded it, even though I was definitely veering towards being like, maybe we just, I just apologized to everybody, but no, glad we did it. And I'm glad you guys are here with me. And I, I, I thank you. So if you are watching this on YouTube and you liked this video, please like it, hit the little thumbs up. There's a little bell icon next to the subscribe button, uh, subscribe, obviously. Uh, but if you hit that bell, you'll also get notifications for any time I put out a new video. And why would you want to, you know, find out last? If you're not first, you're last. And if you're listening to this on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, uh, please just, you know, uh, like, rate, follow, subscribe, all that shit. Uh, a few of my friends, uh, I saw the pod in their Spotify raps today, and it made me feel really good. Um, I know it's, I don't know, maybe it's a small thing or something, but like, because I would see them side by side with other podcasts I really like and respect and stuff, and it made me feel really, really good. And uh, I really appreciate that. You guys are, you guys are all really great. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, hope everyone's doing good. I hope you guys had a, had a good holiday. I hope you're having a good week. I hope you're dealing well with the fucking weather changes, all that stuff. So we will talk soon.